I had to learn how to run a business on cash. No one would loan me money. I could not buy a truck. I could not buy a van from anyone. I had to figure out how to grow this business on cash. And today, we're in a really good position because of, of how we ran our business back then and how I learned how to run the business. Hey, what's up to the point listeners? It's your boy, Chris Yano, the host of To The Point Home Services Podcast. And I'm so excited to have my friend in blue on the screen looking at me. He's back on the podcast, my co-host, Mr. Chad Peterman, CEO of Peterman Brothers in Indianapolis, Indiana. Chad, how you doing, buddy? Thanks for the intro, Chris. I am doing good. Uh, as we talked before the uh, podcast, I've missed a couple trying to get used to the uh, new school schedules with the kids and the this and the that, but uh, we're back and uh, ready to roll. So excited about today. I missed you, man. I'm glad you're I know. Back. I missed you too. I haven't seen you in a while. I know. It feels like, it's like I was like, we know, is it me? Is it you? Like whose fault is it? <laughs> <laughs> I'll get back in the back in the uh, in the school routine. I get it. Well, uh, gonna have another great episode today. The guest is uh, been a listener, which is always cool. Um, not a not a customer. We just met like officially last week, and um, how I met the guest is I was talking with Brian Burton, a friend of mine, Waste No Day podcast uh, sales uh, badass, <laughs> you could say. Um, and he, I was with him over at Tommy's house like a few weeks ago and he was talking about uh, our guest, Aaron and, um, and was kind of like sharing a little bit with me about like his story, just a little bit. And I was like, we should get this guy's guest on here. So, so we have Aaron Hagen on the, on the podcast day, CEO of Mr. Spark. You're like, you're like middle America. Um, I think it's like nine locations, like, or like maybe the newest one is nine locations. He's in Northwest, Ar uh, Northwest Arkansas or Arkansas as Chad says, um, you have to forgive him. Uh, Oklahoma City, Tulsa, Kansas City, Phoenix, uh, Austin, Salt Lake City, Wichita, and Omaha are the, uh, the 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 most recent one. This guy's like a forty-five, fifty million dollar company. Like, so you've done some stuff, Aaron. You're still privately held. Good for you, buddy. Good for you. But welcome to the show. You're the largest, the largest privately owned, Mr. Sparky. Correct? Yeah. Privately yeah. owned. Yes, privately owned. Hey, welcome to the podcast, brother. Are you excited? Yes, man. It's good to be on here. The long time, long time listener, first time caller. Long time <laughs> listener, first time <laughs> caller. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're excited to have you on. I mean, your story is a cool one. And you know, I want to just commend you right up front and to our listeners. Like when I, I love whenever our guests get vulnerable and share like the dirt, like the garbage stuff that they have to go through and you did it yeah. and you had a couple of them. And so I appreciate oh, yeah. you for doing that. Um, but you know, like I said, the important part is, is where the business sits today is a very, very healthy, well-run business. But boy, did you learn some lessons to get there. And, and that's the good stuff that we're going to talk through. I mean, this guy survived a bankruptcy, lost everything, had to start over, had no cash. What, 2017, lost all your techs, like kind of this roller coaster of business. And so um, what will be interesting is to talk about some of those things and then the things that you switched or pivoted or changed that got you to where the business is today, which is incredibly successful. So congratulations on uh, the perseverance. And sometimes the best lessons are learned through the perseverance, right? Um, so I'm excited to jump into it. Are you ready? I'm ready. I mean, to hear, okay. you, to hear you list all those things, it sounds highly dysfunctional. Uh, so uh, <laughs> all of them at one time. No, I'm, I'm ready. No, this is good. So let's do this for the listeners too. I kind of gave an idea, like a quick high level of, you know, the business you're involved in some more stuff, like, but I just been kind of sharing some of the things, maybe just give like a quick high level snapshot of the business and like the number of uh, employees that you guys have today. And just like some of the things that you're involved in. So the listeners again, have a little bit more um, perspective on, on uh, where you're at right now. Sure. Yeah. We're, we're uh, give or take uh 150, 160 employees total that we have. Uh, we're in nine, uh, different locations. Well, we're open our ninth one in, in October. It's already set that uh, we will be uh, rolling that out. Let me surprise some of my people to hear that. But yes, it's happening and uh, <laughs> happening uh, in <laughs> October 1. Surprise! Yeah. surprise. surprise. Yes. You heard it here first. Yeah. So we're opening in Omaha uh, at that point. So uh, excited. So that that that's pretty much it. We will, we, we will finish the year. Uh, if we finish if we finish strong uh, the way we have the rest of the year, we'll finish uh, close to 50 million in between the 45, 50 million, depending on how we finish this year, but it's looking pretty good. Good for you, man. These are all, these are all Mr. Sparky's. 
All Sparkies. Yep. That's it. That's it. All right. electrical service. So, so I will share some of your background for you if you'll right. let me. Yeah, you bet. Um, because I, you know, the one of the very first questions I was asking you is kind of where, you know, usually I'll ask somebody how you got into the trades, all those types of things, but um, I'm going to start this for you. So back in 2009. Uh, is when you bought Mr. Sparky or started, you know, did Mr. Sp started Mr. Sparky, um, you know, great, great economy back in 08, 09, yeah. <laughs> like you picked a great time. So obviously you're very sharp. you like, your yeah. picker is on. You thought, this sounds like a great idea. Let's start a <laughs> trades company while the house market is <laughs> shit. The market's good. Um, so am I questioning your judgment right off the bat? Maybe, you know, but it's 2024 now, right? You've learned some things through it. So started the business back in 2009, Northwest Arkansas. Rogers is actually where you're at. Um, and did I think, okay, you gave me the specific number. It was $369,000 <laughs> in that first year. So I got to ask you, what were you thinking when you started the business back in 2009? And, and nine, like what, like kind of set the stage for me, like while you thought, Hey man, this is the right time. And this is what I want to do. Mr. Sparky. Yeah. So I bought the Mr. Sparky in 09, but I had actually, we, we had, we had had a new construction business for a while and we had uh, kind of made a decision through everything that was going on with the economy at that point that we we're going to shift uh, everything really towards the uh, new construction. So Honestly, to buy the franchise, we had a big ice storm that came through Northwest Arkansas at that point. And that's the only way I was able to even to buy the franchise. So uh, at that point. So, I, you know, the reason why the franchise was so important to me is because of the man that, that started it, the founder, Patrick Kennedy. And uh, a lot of people may not know who he is. We we, we like to call him uh, the, the godfather of uh, electrical service out there and, and the way that we do things right now. Uh, and he was, I was lucky enough to know him well enough to be able to, he, he, I could call him a mentor and I told him that later on and, uh, you didn't know it, but, uh, you were, you were definitely a mentor of mine, uh, through the process. And I got to visit his, his, his shop in in Atlanta, Georgia, and where he grew Mr. Sparky and then ended up ended up selling it and they made a franchise out of it. So I had been there multiple times before uh, and uh, it just made an impact today. Uh, if you were to go back and, uh, you know, we're in a newer building today, but our, our, our last building, if you walked into it, I mean, there were a lot of similarities to uh, his training room he had in Atlanta and our training room there. Cause that was a vision, you know, that I had when I walked through that and being able to see, uh, what he had, he opened my eyes to something different than a new construction or a small business. And it was uh, uh, truly why I am today. And that's the reason why I, I love doing these type things and sharing, uh, you know, where I came from to know that hey, there's a vision, you know, you can have a vision for something bigger and there's something more out there. It's a lot easier to share it too when you're on this side. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah actually. It's no one wants to hear about you when you're going through it. <laughs> yeah. Aaron, I got a question for you because yeah. I've talked to a couple of just randomly a couple of people who are in kind of the franchise space, um, both HVAC and, and otherwise. What what intrigued you about that model that that made you go that direction as opposed to just starting something from the ground up? You know, I've I've been in one side of it just because I was kind of born into you know being in this side of it, but I, I feel like I've I've learned more about kind of the franchise space. What what intrigued you about going that direction? as opposed to, you know, just starting it from the ground up, so to speak. I mean, you started from the ground up either way, but you know what I'm saying? Yeah, no, it's a great question, Chad. What we, well, we were part of ESI, which was, you know, that contractor networking group. Uh, and before, before there was ever a, a Mr. Sparky franchise. And so, and even before that, you know, we were part of, uh, uh, contractor 2000 back in the day was actually uh is now next star so we were we were a part of that and and we we were a part of that when patrick kennedy was a part of that as well and we had actually went and visited his his shop when we were part of that contractor 2000 and got to know him and then he went to the esi so everything that we knew and we knew the the model they took from a franchise was was mr sparky so everything that we got you know from from the contractor group that we we're a part of really at that point, they were just learning 
how to do an electrical service at that. They, they had taken a lot of the findings they found through, through heating and air. And basically when we got the, you know, the manual back in the day was called Instafix and, and uh, they would just kind of like, it was almost like they whited out heating and air and put electrical in there. And so it was kind of plug and play and it's two completely different, uh, two completely different kind of, kind of businesses that, that you're able to run. And so our model was Patrick Kennedy and what he had built there. And so that's really what attracted me more than just being a franchise was the fact that, okay, I'm getting more of this insight from the guy that's done it, been there. And, uh, and my background, I, I, I am an electrician. I was just an electrician back then. Uh, so I was not a businessman. I didn't know, uh, I didn't know the business. Uh, and so I really looked at it as a way to be able to give me a, a, give me a head start, you know, through that. And, uh, it was, it was, it was the right path for us. We've never looked back. Um, and so it, it's been, a, it, it, it's been, it was the right decision for us. Maybe the right decision for everybody, but it was definitely the right decision uh, for us at the time. Yeah. Well, I think the biggest thing there to, I was listening to a podcast with Ken Goodrich and, and he always says, you know, Hey, if you're a, if you're working for somebody and you want to go start your own thing, the best thing you could do is spend about a year learning the business. And it sounds like, you know, this franchise model was that for you, maybe even a little bit quicker, like, okay, here's some of the tools that you need to know on the business side of things that, you know, can allow you to propel a company to, to where you propelled it. So I think that's super smart for, for a lot of listeners out there of like, Hey, where do I start? And, you know, I feel like I'm spinning my wheels. It's like, there's a whole other side of the business that you have to understand, not just the technical aspect of things. So much. It was, it was it's so funny you say that because back then we didn't have anything. I mean, it was, it was not like we really had a business. I mean, we had a business, but we, you know, it was a really a day-to-day type business. It was my dad, brother, and I, uh, you know, at that point and right around that 2008, 2009 period, we all decided to kind of go separate directions just because there were, uh, too many chiefs and not enough Indians, you know, at that point. And I actually made a decision at that point. I was contacting uh, Patrick Kennedy and, and I wanted to come work for him. You know, that was a part of it because I knew I needed to learn more of this stuff and I didn't know there was another option uh, at that point. And uh, through that decision, I, ended up, I obviously decided to, to stick and learn and buy a franchise and go go that direction. But no, I was 100%. I, my, the whole idea was, hey, let me come work for you so I can learn and then I can go back and get my own thing started. Yeah. I've, I've learned one thing um, in this short time that we've been talking already. And that's that I need to meet Patrick Kennedy. <laughs> Patrick Kennedy is no longer with us. So God rest his soul. Damn it. I didn't get to meet Patrick. <laughs> now I need to learn more about Patrick Kennedy. So, yeah. uh, okay. Well, it sounds like he was clearly very influential you know, yes. uh, to you and, and Chad, that's a good point, you know, as you know, part of the appeal of a franchise is there is a, a playbook and you have the help and you can run the playbook, whether it be operations, marketing, whatever. And, and you have some brand equity right from the start like that. Those things can be helpful. Um, not for everybody, for some people. Right. And you've clearly done it and been incredibly, really successful with it, as well as a few others that we that we both know in the franchise business. So um, and then and then. What's interesting is Chad, and I think you're going to find this um, really interesting too, is, you know, we talk about, yeah, we talked about the $369,000 year one, you know, but you heard me say at the beginning of the podcast, we finish this out this year, he's finishing out at 50 million. And what I love about your growth, and we'll talk about this more towards the end is, is uh, you greenfielded this thing. So like you've been greenfielding these other locations, which I know Chad's been through, you know, a lot of these different scenarios too over the last few years. Um, but let's go back for just a second. Um, now let's jump to 2010 because 2010 was a pretty pivotal, pivotal year for you because that's the year that you had to file for bankruptcy. And so the listeners are like, Chris, why you have somebody on here file for bankruptcy? You want me to learn from them? That's right. What's going on? Like, maybe you should just humble yourself for just a moment. Right. Cause like have a little faith in your boy. Like I know what I'm doing because you know, it got through it. And it's kind of a unique situation, right? So it's not like, you know, it's, you can say, oh, he learned all these things from Patrick Kennedy and then he filed for bankruptcy. Like there's some, <laughs> there's some scenarios. So, so maybe for our listeners, because yeah. I mentioned it right up front, just share that scenario mm-hmm. um, on, uh, you know, because at the same time, like at this point in time, you're married, right? You already have a son at this point, right? Your mm-hmm. son is 16, right? Yeah. 
So you already have one son. You're going through this with your family. It's got, that's added stress to it. So if you're listening on the other end, you probably know what I'm talking about. You go through these stressful situations. It's even harder when you got family you're trying to support. But share the uh, share the 2010 story because now you've been in the business, you know, for you know three years, and now you hit you hit a wall. You know, you make it some progress, and you hit a wall, and that wall is bankruptcy. Share that with us. Yeah. So, um, so it had nothing to do with how I ran electrical business uh, at that point, and we talked about what the economy was doing at that point for the residential market there. I had got into doing different things along with uh, having an electrical company. We were building some houses and then we started a, uh, a, a residential development that we were working on at the point. And we've been working on it for several years before the economy had uh, kind of dropped out and ended up the, the bank, uh, it was a crazy story just to make it short. The FDIC came in and took over the bank and the bank called in all the loans that they had out at that point. And, uh, at that point it was either, Hey, you either file bankruptcy or, or you're going to pay it back, uh, you know, pay back the, or pay the loan at this point. And so we really didn't have a decision. Uh, there was not much of a decision we can make other than foreclosure or, you know, or, or, uh, or just filing bankruptcy at that point. And so that's what had happened. Uh, it wasn't because of that, but it, needless to say, uh, I, you know, I had great credit at the time. I, I, I had managed things quite well and the, the bottom just kind of fell out from under us there. And we had to figure out uh, how, else to, how else to run a business. And I, you know, I look back and it may have been the best thing that ever happened to me. I had to learn how to run a business on cash no one would loan me money. I could not buy a truck. I could not buy a van from anyone. I had to figure out how to grow this business on cash. And today we're in a really good position because of, of how we ran our business back then and how I learned how to run the business back then without taking loans out, uh, doing these type things. So it was a really big deal, but I had a, but there was a moment though. There was a lot of fear because I didn't, I had never filed bankrupt. I, I didn't know what was, I, I had no idea what, what was going on there. So a relatively young guy. And I did not know what it meant as far as me owning this franchise and me owning my business. It did not reflect. It wasn't because of the business that I filed bankruptcy, but I was afraid I was going to lose the franchise because of it. Uh, and I remember being really worried and I get a phone call one day and it was one that I've been dreading. Where did the phone call come from? Yeah. Because this is important. Like yeah. your phone rings and, and if I, I, here's how I envision that, Aaron. Yes. Is the phone rings, you probably look at caller ID back then. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> and it says, what? Who's calling you? Yeah, it was Terry Nicholson that was calling me at that point. Yeah. <laughs> Why was Terry calling you? Yeah. So Terry, they had got some letters. Uh, obviously, when you had to file bankruptcy, everyone you owe money to gets letters. Uh, and so they had gotten a letter. And so he was calling to try to figure out uh, what was going on. And and I, I knew it was coming at some point. And so anyway, he had called to say, hey, Aaron, I get this letter. What what the heck? What the heck's going on here? And I had had a relationship uh, with 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 Terry, you know, before that he, we had, we had talked and uh, actually we had talked about me going to work for them as well from that, that organization before I ended up buying the, the Sparky. So he was trying to find out what was going on. And, and at that point, all I know is I was just like, I was in damage control mode and all I want to do is just reassure him that, uh, you know, they didn't make a bad decision. And I just remember telling him at that point that, you know what, Terry, I don't know what you have to do at this point. I don't know if you have to take this franchise away or if you have a decision in that, but I will tell you, if you will let me run this thing, I will promise you, I will make you proud. I will make everybody in that organization proud. I will make Patrick Kennedy proud uh, of this. If you'll just give me the shot and let me, let me continue to run this business. Cause this is all I got, you know, at this point. And, you know, you know, to his benefit, uh, he was very gracious with that. And, uh, and, uh, we were able to continue on and, and, uh, and see some success. Yeah. And this is where I, I, I like, I was you know setting the stage for now this next phase because yeah. now you're rebuilding and you're talking about like, nobody's loaning you anything. So you're building this thing off, off cash. Yeah. Like talk about a humbling moment already, but also probably really prepared you for 
like where you know, like that, that moment because you i bet you when we talk about it you probably still have that feeling from from that moment like that oh like, yeah i mean it's in that coat that sticks with you and it drives some people right because you don't ever get back to that again because you're already yes. from it. so you start building the business again so what changes after that like how did you start to begin to build the business back up again like what were the what were the steps that you took away from that or the things you started doing to start growing it and maybe if you can um we didn't really talk about this you know or, uh, earlier but um maybe if you just share some like reference points along the way before we get to 2017 like just share some of the growth plan up to there and like maybe some of the growth patterns that you had and like what you were doing like that what did you learn and what did you start implementing to grow it yeah so uh, you know, at, at that point, I wasn't re necessarily rebuilding because I really didn't have a whole lot. You know, we talked about in 2009 at 369,000, there wasn't a whole lot to rebuild, you know, from uh, at that point. We just had to figure out. And honestly, I didn't know how to do it the other way. So I didn't know how to, to go and, and borrow money and, and, and build a business that way anyway. So I just learned a new way of being able to do it. And I just figured out just, I think, from pure grit and determination of, of how, you know, how I could how it could keep pushing on you, you kind of, whether you like it or not, how to uh, rob from Peter to pay Paul, you know, just, just whatever I could do to be able to push some money around to make sure that we were able to do what, what we needed to do uh, from that. I, so in about that time, so obviously uh, calls, uh, w there wasn't abundance of calls, you know, when we were dealing with that at that point. So that was number one, we had to figure out how to get the phone calls in. I remember making a, uh, a trip, uh, to Las Vegas. I didn't tell you about this, uh, Chris, but we, we made a trip. Uh, I had a buddy of mine that owned, uh, owned a, another Mr. Sparky and he's actually my COO now, uh, Daryl Boyd. And, uh, we were both going through the same thing and we had heard this, this, Mr. Sparky, it was a corporate Mr. Sparky in, in Las Vegas, was following behind their heating and air company and was doing these inspections behind their heating and air company and were, were, able to make, were able to make money and be able to do that. And so we both flew there and, and shared a room, you know, and uh, at the stratosphere, I remember. Uh, Hang on, important question. Yeah. Single? I knew you were going to have that. <laughs> Definitely a double. Uh, that was one a, a one double size bed. Hey, listen, there were some of those things that we we have multiple people. And we needed to share beds, but we we figured it out back in the day. But that one definitely was. So anyway, we we rode behind these guys and figured out that you know what they were doing. We just needed to figure out what they were doing, and then I came back and they had a we had a local heating air contractor here that I had a relationship with, and I talked him into let me have his customer database. And I started calling, calling people and setting up these appointments myself. And then I go out and run them and run kind of with some things that I learned. So we learned the process of, of how to do that and how to make something out of nothing. And honestly, that's how we paid our bills and started what started what I did. Yeah, that's some guerrilla marketing, baby. You'd make Ken Goodrich really proud right now by hearing that. Yeah. Yeah. That was, that was what we did. And, uh, and, and it worked out, you know, it's really gritty, uh, and uh, to be able to go through it and do it. But so that's where we started then. And, and, uh, then, you know, I started learning there were people doing generators out there. And so I started learning a little about doing generators and, and, um, I, same thing. I went and flew to a couple of different places to be able to learn from guys that were doing, doing well with generators and learning what I could do with generators. And I came back and I remember I had a, I had a, uh, home show that I had talked one of our contractors and let me put a, like a, this shell of a, of a generator there. And I just asked me about, you know, asking about generators, you know, at the home show. And I, I created a bunch of different appointments and leads that I went and ran. Uh, and I think, you know, at that point we, we jumped after that year of the, the generators that I think I sold at, and we jumped almost to a million dollars, uh, in, uh, 2010 or 2011 off of, generator sales. And what's funny about it is that was a great boost for us. But today that's maybe 5% of our, of the revenue that we do. We do very little in generators anymore. It's a really different market out there for it than it was at that point. But uh, yeah, through the process there. So we, uh, we did that and incrementally you ended up growing 2013. Um, I knew that 
I knew early on that probably Northwest Arkansas wasn't as big as for what the vision that I had of what I wanted to do. And going back to Patrick Kennedy and looking at all the trucks he was running out of Atlanta, I was like, man, I want to do something bigger than this. And so I, I knew it was going to have to be a multi-location deal, but no one was doing it back then. Uh, I didn't have any, there was no, there was no roadmap to how to do that uh, at that point. And so I had a guy that, that, uh, we were helping. He would come down. He'd do training with us, and he owned the the Mister Sparky in in uh, in Oklahoma City. But it was he wasn't even an electrician, and he had no electricians working for him at that point. So it was just a a recipe for disaster. There, he had lost everybody, and and really didn't have many. And so he ended up asking me multiple times would I buy his company from. So. That well, wasn't necessarily Greenfield, but it's about as close as one as you as you could get. Uh, I actually bought it from the guy for a lot more than probably I should have paid for it. Uh, but that was the first uh, location in in 2013, and and I remember I still remember going and spending uh, you know two to three nights a week in in Oklahoma City, and then you know uh, of the week, and then coming back and spending the rest in Northwest Arkansas, and then I spend three days a week in Northwest Arkansas and two days in the other. I'd go go back and forth, back and forth and scared to death. I remember driving back and forth from that and just worried, you know, I just made this big commitment and worried about what's going to happen. And just in my head having this, like, this will not fail. It will not fail. We will not fail. We will not fail. And because this three hour drive, I'm going, this will not fail. It cannot fail. We will not fail. We will make this will work. This will work. And uh, you know, it's, there's just so many different moments that you think like that and just the mindset of like we this will not fail. It can't fail. We are going to make this work and figure it out. Uh, but I do remember a pivotal moment that my wife, my wife had uh, sat down with one night. We just had our we just had our our second son. And uh, she was like, you can't keep doing this. This is this is too much. Uh, you, you can't keep going back and forth. And. And early on, I just made a decision that I had to trust more people to be able to do these things. I couldn't do it myself. And honestly, it was the best decision ever. And today, you know, we have locations ran by people that that uh, are really smart. My leadership team are, are a whole lot smarter than I am, you know, and it's just that's a key of surrounding people that 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 are really smart and can help you through that and trusting them to be able to do it. I mean, there were some locations and, you know, you may you know, think it's crazy or not, but there were some locations that I didn't, I didn't go to for a year and a half, you know, and they, I've you know, been, I, I didn't even open up. I, I looked at places online and figured out how to open, open to where it was and send people down there to look at it and send me videos and I make decisions, you know, and we had a pretty good parameter. We, we weren't, and I, I wasn't there. They were able to run that and we had enough infrastructure to be able to go and do that. And so this timeline, you know, speed it up this timeline. So we went, you know, about every two years we had, we were opening another location. We were learning how to get profitable and go do it. And, and we felt like, Hey, we, we've got a pretty good, pretty good idea how to, you know, how to do these and open these things up and, and make them profitable uh, before we went and did a, before we went and opened another location. So there are a lot of different, a lot of different things. We, we, we've done other things. So, uh, you know, Chad, I know you guys, you guys have done it with you have heating, air, plumbing, electrical, everything like that. We, we tried the plumbing side. I thought at one point it's like, hey, I've got three locations. I've got Northwest Arkansas, Tulsa and Oklahoma City. Now I'm just going to build out. Maybe I'll try brand in these three different areas, you know, and, and do that. And and uh, I just fell on my face with the plumbing. Uh, we, we put forth so much effort to be able to get that going and uh you know, it, it was just a difficult thing. It was another pivotal moment when we decided to be able to close that, to close that plumbing division down. Uh, all of a sudden, our growth, we've been hitting a wall. Uh, you know, this is so long ago. I think we were, we were hitting this five, six million dollar wall and just kept banging up against it. And when I closed that down and focused in on that is when we started seeing this, this trajectory go up. And it was uh, uh, just those different, those different moments. So we, we decided at that point, we're going to stick with things that, that, that we know and we're good. We're really good at electrical. I understand that electrical service. And we've been really good at starting, uh, you know, green building these new locations. And so we're going to stick with doing that. I had, had very little experience in acquiring other locations 
and doing that. So I really wasn't interested in doing that. I wanted to start it from, from scratch and be able to go from there and get it profitable, then move on and grow and do others. So that takes us pretty much to that 2017 yeah. point. Gotcha. Well, so, so actually there's a couple of key things yeah. that you, that you said in there. Um, and Chad, you know, fill in any gaps on what you heard, but, um, one, it was, you had to like, I mean, you had to like delegate to leaders to go open other markets and run them. And I'm not sure if that has something to do with your, um, non-negotiables with your family on travel or what the reasoning was for not going to those locations, or maybe it was just to give the leaders there like the authority and not like be distracted. Um, so I'm not, not sure about, um, about all that, but, um, the other thing I heard that you, you say in there was you, um, you caused a distraction. So you, you added, you added another service, um, which takes away from something else, right? When you're adding those things. And, um, and by the way, I think Chad knows it's like, this is a common thing that happens as people start another service, um, before you should start before you've even like oh, yeah. nailed the one you got or the opportunity when you got, and then you go a mile wide and an inch deep, you're no yeah. good to anybody. Like you're, you're not, you're not your best self and I on, on any scenario. So, but again, it's a lesson that has to be learned sometimes. We and were not ready for it. Yeah. We a hundred percent were not ready for it. Yeah, and you think about how, how much that probably delayed what you could have done because you did it, but you also don't know what you, you know, until you, until you try, right? Like, you, so you did that and that's another lesson, you know, another lesson learned. So those are a couple of things I heard in that story. Yeah. I think of the other P I think distractions can come in all shapes and sizes. I think in this industry, we often look at the distraction as starting another trade. You know, the big one for me at least, and, and I don't know how you guys feel about this, but like in today's world, to me, the distractions are the millions of software and the millions of new fandangled things that are out there. And it's like, do you, you know, they're all great. They all do fantastic things, but it's like, what value am I going to gain from this? Do I have the people that can even implement it? And oftentimes a lot of these softwares are only as good as the people behind them. Uh, and you've got to have those people. And if you don't, then, you know, why are you doing it? And all of a sudden you look up and then on the line item in your P&L, you're paying for eight different softwares and you maybe use two of them. Um, so I think it's just important for listeners to understand that distractions can come in all shapes and sizes. We've had plenty uh, over the years. And it's really to, to your credit, you know, just kind of buckling down and saying, hey, uh, this isn't a failure. You probably learned a lot from doing that. Yeah, it cost you some money. It did that. But, you know, what is the cost of just saying, eh, this probably isn't for us, at least right now. We're going to focus on this other thing. So I think that's really impactful uh, for, for listeners to hear. I think the, the question that I would have for you, because I think that you hear it from so many uh, people looking to scale, right? Like you mentioned, I knew I wanted to do something bigger uh, and I was going to figure out how to do it. Um, but I think the people, the roadblock that people, so many people run into is they're afraid to trust anybody else. And I think a lot of that comes from, you know, the technician mentality of, well, no one can do it as good as I can. And tell me a little bit about that evolution. You said it was, you know, the best thing your wife had told you, Hey, you can't be doing this. You got to trust some people. Tell me a little bit about kind of like what you learned. And as you look back on that, because I think it's impactful for people to hear because so many people are running up against it. Like they don't trust anybody to do anything and they wonder why they can't scale. It's like, like, well, you, you only have, you only have as many hours in the day as everybody else. Yeah. So I think personally, for one thing, I, I know what I'm good at and I know where, where, where I don't have, where, where the strengths aren't, you know, I know where the strengths are and where they aren't. Uh, and so I, I do know I'm very strong, a uh, very strong training and, and operationally. I mean, I can, I can do that all day long. You know, when you talk from a from an accounting standpoint, man, I, I have learned to be able to trust and I got to hand that to someone else and let them let them roll with that at that point. Uh, but I also found out there's a, I had to be able to trust people from an operational standpoint or there was no way that I was going to be able to grow. So the gift in my wife saying, hey, you can't do this. We can't keep doing this and and, and build a strong family. Uh, the gift in that was I had to figure out how to do that. And so the decision, so Chris, to go back, one of the questions, whether I made a decision because it was a family or it was because of giving handling, I think it was, it was, it was both. 
at that point. I knew that I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to continue. I couldn't continue on the travel overnight travel. So I made decisions on the close enough that I could, I would leave, I would leave, you know, at 3 a.m. in the morning and be able to drive to a location to be able to spend, you know, a good portion of the day there. And I would drive back. So I was make I was home for, you know, at a regular time that I would typically be home if I was working at the office there. So I figure other things of being able to do it and workarounds, you know, uh, to be able to do that and to make sure I was there uh, early on. But then it came to the point of, bringing in people and just being able to trust that they were good enough to be able to do it. And because I couldn't be there, I wasn't there that I had to hand off that to them. Uh, and the other point is making sure that we had really great communication. So that's a piece of, of who we are today. Like we use, uh, you know, we use our, our video conferencing system, I don't know of anyone else that, that, that uses it near as well as we do with that. Uh, I meet, we have a meet, we have meetings throughout the day. Our meeting rhythm is set up where there's a constant communication uh, and it's just really getting on the same page early in the day is what it is. So we, we did, um, and this may be jumping in the story, but during COVID, you know, we, we were utilizing, we were utilizing our, we had the, the video conference at that point, but we had, you didn't, we really figured out how to utilize it better during that time. You know, early on in COVID when they had basically threatened to shut everything down uh, and we were very early in it and they were talking about, Hey, I'm going to, uh, you know, national guards are going to come out and, and mandate you got to stay at home for two weeks and that whole thing. And all that came through. And at that point, just the just way my mind works, you know, I had my team and I was like, all right, we're putting together a two week training plan. Uh, and we're going to make sure that that everybody has work. They're going to get paid, but they're going to work. They're going to stay at home, and we're going to come out of that two weeks better, you know, than we go into it. So we're going to make sure there's a positive going into it. So when we come out of it, they're going to be better than where they are at that point. But um, but through that piece, as we started meeting with our everybody in the morning, all of our techs, and we called it a huddle, and all of our techs for ten minutes. That's all we did, and it was all set up that Daryl, my CEO and I, we were the only two coming into our office at that time, but we came into the office, we got in front of the, uh, the, our, our, our TVs, our video conferencing, the camera, and we pulled it up and we were able to see everybody log in from everywhere, all the different locations log in and we could see them. And so it was all about just feeding them full of positivity and making sure that, you know, they didn't have that anxiety that they knew that there was a job there that we're going to continue doing this. We're going to continue doing well, and we're going to come out of this better than we were before. And through that, we started having fun. So we started, we went through and started giving shout outs to, to the guys that had the best day the day before in that meeting. And it's all part of our meeting every day. And then we just started nicknaming guys. And now it's become a piece of what our is now. Now when guys get a shout out, we're nickname or we're finding a nickname for them. They're just crazy, crazy, things that probably need to stay in the locker room sometimes, but it's just, you know, Aaron, what was your nickname? You know, just oh. fun. Uh, <laughs> I didn't have a nickname. Uh, I was given the nicknames. We were given nicknames out to guys, but it was today. I would say that 10 minute time is probably my favorite time of the day, just 10 minutes. And we still do it. And Daryl and I have a great chemistry. We get on there and we just have fun with it. And it's all about, there's not a, there's not a negative thing that goes on during that meeting. It's just about positivity. And uh, so we learned a whole lot through the communication piece of that. So when, when you're steadily communicating with people, you can trust them a whole lot more to be able to, you know, you know where they're at, you know, what's going on. Uh, and I think that's, that was able to help us as well. I don't know if that answered your question, Chad. Yeah, absolutely. No, I appreciate you sharing that. I think that's really key, especially when you've got multi locations, right? I mean, we deal with that as well. It's like, you know, how do you make everybody feel part of the group? And, you know, they may not be in the main location, but they're somewhere and yours are even stretched yeah. even further than mine. So you've got, you know, that distance is a, is a definite factor. So kudos to you for uh, buckling down and, and figuring out that communication channel. Okay. I'm going to make a commitment real quick. By, before this podcast is over, I'm going to come up with your nickname, Aaron. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry. I got plenty for Chad. I'm like, I got all kinds of nicknames oh, for Chad. Fantastic. But this one will be one I can share online. So I'm going to be thinking through that. 
um, and trying to pay attention at the same time, but it's just going to come to me. Like that's yes. how it's going to like, it's going to come okay. to me and I'm going to know what it is. So when I find it, I'm going to, I'm going to share that towards the end. I hope if not, I've really screwed myself for the end of this podcast. <laughs> so I do want to take a step back real quick. So I yes. do agree. Communication is absolutely critical. Yeah. And I'll tell everybody, especially everybody that's on our team, communication is a core value at Rhino, but it's also the one thing that you have 100% complete control over. Like, you can control how you communicate, when you communicate, and what you communicate, all those things. Um, so I do want to take a step back, though, because I don't want to miss this part of the story. So you talked a little bit about growing the business, and I think you said like five million or, or, five million or something yeah. like that. So you like things are progressing, clearly. Like you are building, and you've learned the things, and you're starting to build the business, and you're on like a nice little roll from your million bucks up to your $5 million number. And then 2017 happens, and, be, and I really want to hit on this because – there's actually a really, really great story. There's like two great stories in this from my perspective that I, I hope we uncover in this conversation. And that's in 2017, you lose all your techs. Yeah. I mean, that's that's pretty hard to do. Yeah. To lose all, I mean, to kind of have that scale and to lose you. all your You piss somebody off. Like somewhere somebody got mad. You know, I'm assuming, right? Because, yeah. um, you know. Like everybody says, I'm out of here. Well, kind of hard to go and run jobs yeah. without your technicians. So, so what, like, how did that, how did that happen? Like you're making such great progress to now be like, boom, you hit another, you know, you hit another, you know, valley in the, you know, in the story. Like what happened? Yeah. We had started putting together at that point, our core values and started building kind of, we always thought that, Hey, these are, we have values. We run our business, but we didn't have anything written down and, and, uh, so we really wanted to, we, we worked really hard. We spent probably six months with my leadership team putting together our core values and what we believed in. And, and as we began to look at it, we really weren't living by a lot of those core values at that point. And, um, and so we started making some subtle changes. And when you've been, so like I shared with you, Chris, my, my personality, when you talk, when we, we do a strength finder test with all my, our leadership team, and it gives you like your, your top five strengths. And my number one strength is, is competition. And I had, I had built a, I had built a culture around, around competition and it become, it, it, it had become a, a toxic culture. Uh, we had, we had built so strongly that I knew we could build something on, uh, I, there's just my whole brain worked around how we, how do we become competitive? You know, how we do competitive things. And it got to the point that, you know, it was even cutthroat, you know, in some, some areas, not that it was coming from me, but as you push down these competitive type things and everything's, how do you beat this guy and how, how you beat this guy and what are you going to do to beat him? What are you going to do here? And it, it became this, this almost, a. Uh, uh, it wasn't almost, it, it was, it was that. And as we began to back up and go like, Hey, we got to figure out a better way because we're not living by these core values that we truly believe in. And inadvertently, you know, I, had, I had, I have pushed this, this toxic culture on there and it, it took a lot for me to go back and, and, and just swallow that and own it, you know, and, and to be able to see, but losing like every one of your texts at, at a, at one time can make you do a lot of things like that. Uh, you can sit back and go like, okay, this is me, you know, and we're going to figure out how to do it. And so a lot of those things we learned from a communication side, from everything out through, through that piece, literally there were so many lessons that we learned that, like I said, it's kind of going through bankruptcy. I talked about how the things that I learned through that, this one, um, we, what we learned was, was we weren't training near enough. What happened was, is we went back and we went out and we went on the road and recruited and hired. And that's all I did for three months, recruited, uh, hired and trained. And we would, we would get two people in front of us and we have a two day, we have a two day training course. We call it our nine steps that we, that we run and all of our techs have to go through it. And, and, and we were doing that maybe two, three times a year. And we get all these guys together and they would come in there if they didn't need to do it. And we would do, we would uh, do this two day class. And we knew we needed to get these. We, we had, we had urgency. We had to get, we had to get these guys up and running and, and creating revenue uh, much faster than we did before because we didn't have anybody else to create the revenue. And, and so 
we we would maybe hire two people and we turn around and we do our nine steps and Daryl and I would be in front of these teaching this whole two day class in front of two different two guys, you know, at that point and 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 then we started learning. Okay, I don't want to do it in front of two guys, so we started bringing in some of our veterans that have been there. Of course, they weren't a lot of people that were had a very long tenure at that point. So they, they may have just went through it a month before, but they were coming back through it again. And so we continued to train on that. And we figured out that we could turn, we could turn a guy into a revenue, a revenue producing guy. And, you know, we do it uh, average per truck is something is, is a, is a KPI that we follow really closely here. And we figured we could get that guy to that, to that KPI, that number that we needed them to be at so much faster by doing it this way. So it was something that completely changed, completely changed what, what we do and how we do things uh, at this point. And we were able to turn it around. Uh, and uh, we, we actually went positive uh, that, that next year, as far as top line revenue, uh, even after losing everybody and having to re rehire and get everybody trained back up. Uh, and, and that's, you know, growth just continue to move on from that because of the lessons that we learned going through it. So not something I'm proud of because obviously saying that, Hey, I, I built this toxic culture and I'm not a toxic guy. That's the other thing I was saying. I'm not a toxic guy. I'm not a guy that, that, that spews the toxic. That's not, that's not who I am, but inadvertently that's what I had built there. And so we had to go back and, and, uh, and, really switch and do some different things up and the lessons we learned have been extremely valuable that we're still still utilizing today i uh i i call I, what, see if you remember this from our call thanks for sharing that story that's yeah. a sucky thing to say out loud too but it's also you know like because you have to really like be humble to do it again much easier to say when you're down the road a little bit past that yeah um but what did i what did i tell you on our call that I challenge. Do you if I challenged you on this a little bit when I when you start talking about a toxic and toxic environment, it's because because you I look at you uh, from the short time I've gotten to talk to you, but also from what I've heard about you from others is like you you have a big heart. You're actually a really really great guy, um, and that's but you you created this toxic environment, which then made you toxic. Yeah, not on purpose not on purpose. That was not the intent, right? Yeah. That is not the intent. It just happened that that strategy of pushing and competing. And by the way, like creating competitions, completely. Okay. I Absolutely. Think that you have to do those things. Yeah. But you know, but how, like how you implement that strategy, the way that you talk to somebody, the way that you use one person against the other, like, yeah, be very careful with those things yeah. in, in competition. Um, and if somebody keeps losing, like, where's their, you know, where's their self-esteem go? You know, yeah. so, but, but it's, it is a, it's a very humbling experience. You know, like, oh crap, like I didn't intend for it to go that way, but I was the toxic one. And to be able to take that, own it, and then like, you know, make that change and move on. Like that's, that's a leader. That's what leaders do. Um, So I, I commend you on that. Cause you just kind of like said, well, we're going to change this thing up and, and grow again. Now you've got a few different scenarios you've been through peaks and valleys that you now can take right. through and, and you can grow. So I commend you on that. Well, it sucked going through it. Uh, it's like <laughs> I joked, I laughed. I was telling someone the other day that I, I you know, I used to pray for wisdom, and uh, every, you know, every day my, my regular prayers were I, I would pray for wisdom. Uh, then I started going through all this conversation. Kind of, I started realizing that I'm gaining wisdom through all this crap that I'm going through. That I that I changed my prayers. Like God, okay, give me wisdom without the pain. Uh, I, 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 can I get this where I don't have to go through the pain? Is there another way that I can gain this without having to go through all this pain and struggle that we've been through? I don't know that that's how it works. Right. Yeah. That, well, that's how I'm praying. Uh, yeah. so, uh, <laughs> See if it works. It's yeah. like praying for patience. By yeah, the way. Exactly right. Be, be careful what you ask for, right? <laughs> Go ahead, Chad. You're going to say something, buddy. I cut you off. Oh no, I, I was just going to say, yeah. I think it's 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 a lot about uh, a lot about embracing those those tough times, right? And you mentioned a couple of them where you know it's it's not 
oh, this is the end of the world. It's, you know, how do I embrace this, learn from it, and then continue to move on. And it sounds like in this instance, yeah, you learned that, you know, the importance of training, the importance of setting your team up for success um, and taking everything into consideration. Okay. Um, if I make this one decision, well, it could have a ripple effect, especially when you're trusting others to kind of carry that out. It may be, well, I just told them to produce revenue. And it's right. like, well, to me, when you start training, you teach them how, and then you coach to the process and then you bring in the competition. So I think that's one thing, you know, we've learned it as well. It's like when you don't give them the direction on how you want it done, um, all of a sudden it can get toxic very, very simply. Cause when we don't have answers as humans, we fill in the gaps of like, well, he said, go get it. So this is how I'm going to go get it. And you know, things can, can go south really quickly. So mm-hmm. even though the intent, the intent right. is 100%. Yeah. Creating competition is a great thing. Um, but you know, uh, have we armed our people with how to get there and then coach to that? Yeah. 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 And then, and then getting others to, you know, come alongside that. I, you know, you, you mentioned something, you can, you guys started working on your core values pretty late in the business. Yeah. Um, you know, and I think that core values are underrated. Like people create them because they think they need to create them like for the sake of creating them. But you actually have to like live those core values to have, you know, to maintain your integrity, your business integrity, your personal integrity, I think. Um, and they can change as the business evolves and changes, right? Like, and so, uh, cause the worst thing you can do is put it out there and then not, and then lead the business and not follow them. That's a good way to create a toxic culture. Cause people are, you know, you've heard people say they leave their you know, leaders, not their companies. And that's right. Uh, but something important. So, okay. So guys, we're almost like an hour into this thing already. So I want to, I have a couple more yeah. questions I want to get to. Um, now, you know, like now we're like, okay, so let's just, let's talk up to date. It's 20, 2024. Um, some businesses, in the COVID period, which you're kind of talking about a lot of businesses, uh, were order takers, right? Like it was easy to scale and grow the businesses. Tons of acquisitions happened in that time. A lot of great stories have come from that. Um, the M and a world was absolutely insane during that market, but we were order takers. Like, let's be honest, like, let's call it what it is. That's what, that's how, that's how it was easy to grow and scale a business. Um, and then we get into, let's call it last year. This is the same conversation I just had with Ken Haynes, uh, CEO of Wrench Group on um, last week when I was interviewing him. And it's around like, oh crap, like we got to start, we got to start paying attention to all the blocking and tackling and running these businesses again, because it's, we're no longer just order takers. We got to go and find the business. And by the way, it's getting more expensive, you know, and marketing costs are going up and inflation costs are going up and this and then that. Um, but in a lot of ways, what you've been through have prepared you for this. Oh yeah. I mean, you opened up in this actually were significantly worse than, yes. than this, but potentially depending on how <laughs> this presidential stuff goes, who knows where we go from here, but the, yeah. but the market is what it is. Um, and you, you know, you have been through a lot of different lessons. You've had the grit, you've had the perseverance and you've had the heart to keep going. And, and here you are, you know, running, you know, a hopefully $50 million, you know, electrical operation by the end of this year. Like what are these things that you've taken away from that, that you think have a- applied to you as a leader in this business? I mean, you got nine, you have nine locations, like you're leading other people leading these locations for you. So what have you learned if, as far as you as a leader in this, uh, in, from all of this? And what are you, <clears throat> excuse me, what are you passing down? to other leaders to help from learn from the past that you've been through to help uh, the business continue to be successful and stay together. So those are great questions. I think uh, from passing down, we're still learning how we can get better at, at, at uh, developing leaders in this business. And I think it's probably the, probably our, our, our number one um, priority right now is as we continue to grow is how do we, how do we develop, how do we develop leaders and the right kind of leaders that we want to, and put them in a place where they can uh, see success. And I think uh, along with that is being able to share these stories, being able to share these. Uh, that's the one thing that I, uh, that I talk about. I, I want to be vulnerable because I want, I want, I want them to be able to learn from this. I want other, you know, we do a lot of where, where we have a, we mentor different companies where they're within this franchises uh, franchise. We've done it for the last two years and, and, uh, 
and it's been fun. We'll bring them in here and we'll have a, a, a two or three day deal where we just, we just pour into them uh, from our leadership team and be able to help them and, and share different things. And, you know, I think that's, that's a piece of it is being able to be able to tell that and be able to understand that and have patience with our leaders. Right. Because that's the other part is we can real quickly go, this guy's failing. He's not any good. We need to change him and get someone else out of there. Well, you, you learn so much through failures, you know, and sometimes it's really difficult to be able to do. Uh, and we want to eliminate that as quickly as possible so they can learn that. Those are the kind of things that we're trying to train and, uh, and do that. But um, I think, the, the thing that I've, I've learned more is I, I love, I love the fact that, that I have an opportunity to be able to give back and be able to help. Uh, at this point, like I said, some of my favorite times are, are working with some of these other franchises that are brand new and, and are really learning and struggling and, and I can relate, you know, uh, to, to, the, to those type of things you're going through. And, and, uh, and I can, and now it's really fun that, that I can bring them into my in, into our home office, uh, and they can have the same kind of vision that or similar type vision that I had when I went into Patrick Kennedy's shop so many years ago. And man, that fills me full. Uh, that, that that fills a cup. That's it's really cool to be able to see kind of a full circle thing that I've, you know, that I I've been given this gift that I can I can actually pay it forward a little bit through this and. That's been a really fun. That's been a really fun piece for us. Uh, it's been a really fun piece for me. I have a lot of fun doing that. A lot easier now, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I uh, I commend you, my friend. Like, way to go. Because uh, a lot of people wouldn't make it through it. You know, wouldn't make it through it. Like, it's hard. Business is hard. Yeah. Like, you know, it says it's easy. It's- hasn't been, hasn't been in it long enough yet. <laughs> yes. It's <Yeah>. hard. <laughs> it you know, is hard. This business is hard when people come in, you know, we get calls a lot of times from people that are looking into, to, to buying a business or starting a bit, starting one of these businesses or something. I'm very straightforward with them. I just want to say, man, it, this, this is, this is not easy. It's not the business that we're in. is not one of the business that you can just, come in and, and, uh, and, and be an absent owner, you know, and, and grow something like that. You've got to be in the middle. These type of business is just not one of those kind of things that you can open up and pay people to be able to run it and people walk through and be order. Take. It just, that's not, that's not what this is. It's really, really difficult. And it's not that it's not impossible. It's not that I'm doing something special that someone else can't do, but it is the fact that I've been very present and you've got to be present during those times to be able to learn and to be able to grow and to go to, uh, to, to be able to grow a business from start. Guys, I think I got it. Oh boy. I think I got it. So I will wait. I will wait till I'm, I'm closing, but I'm going to share it with you. And I think I friggin' nailed it too. I'm feeling really good about it. Oh, yeah. I mean, um, if you, if I say it and you think it's stupid, just keep it to yourself. <laughs> <laughs> chat will let me know um i will just say this you know to try and like close you know close this thing out um you know i i'm a big big believer uh and i know you're a faith-based guy too i think this is great like these are the lessons that you have to learn to be able to lead from where you've been created to lead and 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 mr sparky happens to be that platform for you right right um and you went through those different trials to learn lessons and to get through them. And now you are a great leader, not only for the business, but a leader for your people, leader for your leaders too. It's great to continue to scale these businesses. Cause as you said early on, like you have to be able to delegate and trust others to get these things done. Chad and I've had these conversations. Chad has a, you know, a huge team. Um, and Chad can't do all these things. Chad doesn't want to do all these things, but he's got great ideas. He needs people to go execute on them. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you've done a good job, man, of like getting through this stuff and like being okay with eating humble pie. But you said a few things in there that I just want to go back on. <clears throat> um, you had talked about early on just being a student, like when you went to Vegas, you know, you're going to Vegas to learn. And then when you launched, you, uh, you, when you uh, bought the guy, you know, the, the other uh, location that you went to learn, like you were going to learn these things um, and continuously being, you know, a student. And a lot of the most successful 
know, companies that I've been in, my friends, Chad, like our buddies, like these guys are constantly students and they're all behemoths. Like they're monsters. That's so that's one of those traits that a lot of them have. And you, and you continue to do that. Um, and then you, you know, said, Hey, I got distracted from my strengths on what I'm good at. Let me focus on my strengths. Let me hire for those like that, or that's their strength. You know, another like critical miss that people have often, you know, if you're not good at books for the love of God, go find somebody, a partial, a part-time CFO, somebody, a good, you know, um, bookkeeper to manage your books for you that know what they're doing. Um, and then you, you said other thing that we kind of blew right past. And I just want to talk about it for a second. And on your drive back home for three hours, you're saying, I will not fail. I will not fail. Like I will not fail. There is a big part of this, you know, and I'm a big believer in like self-confidence and like talking to yourself and like making things happen, you know, and I do that every single morning, like Mm -hmm. in in various ways, but yeah, man, you should be telling yourself, you should be showing up for yourself, you know, and we forget to do those things, you know, and it might sound silly. Like you're listening to it thinking like, that's not stupid to talk to yourself. It's not stupid. A lot of very incredibly successful people look in the mirror and talk to themselves because you're looking at the most accountable person, right? Like call yourself out, you know, but also, you know, talk good about yourself too, because you're doing a good job. Well, our, actually- our minds, our minds naturally default to negative, right? And so if you're not constantly talking positive to yourself and having, like you said, the daily affirmations and talking through the positive things, I mean, I, I, I promise you, you know, we didn't spend a lot of time talking about that, but that's a huge part of who I am today is the fact that that now it's just on, it's on default mode. Now, now it just, now, now that just happens in my head where I'm thinking positively. And if if people knew the things that I think of during the day, they would think I, I don't know, (laughs) conceited or something like that, but I'm, I'm just trying to convince myself and just continue. Hey, this is, this is part of it. That's yeah. It's a very true statement. It's your subconscious. You've actually got your autopilot in there now because you've done it so many times in a row. And like, I'm actually, I'm actively in that phase right now of doing it differently, but where like daily affirmations is a big deal. Yeah. And, you know, and also like, where did I miss the mark the day before that I won't miss today? There's accountability in there too. Like I'm loving that exercise. I've been doing the last, you know, call it you know, 45 days, but that's a big deal. We blew right past that, but that was what that is. Like it's you telling yourself like, I will not fail. And then you come up with whatever it is, the non-negotiable for you. And if your purpose is strong enough, you won't fail. If you legit believe your purpose is strong enough to drive you, you know, to do something, but you created the, you know, you're, that you're now your subconscious just works in that way. Um, and that is not easy to do, by the way, it does take some, like, it does take, you know, creating that habit and, you know, creating your autopilot, not an easy task to do. Um, but then, you know, I, I, the last thing I heard too, and I want your, the, the other franchisees that are listening to this too, because I know there's going to be a bunch of the franchisees that are in the authority brands, you know, family that will be able to hear this, um, you know, reach, you know, reach out to, you know, to Aaron or any of the other, you know, franchisees that you have, any of your other peers that have, you know, are having some success and ask for the freaking help, man. Like stop letting your pride get in the way. Just ask for the help. Um, this is one thing Chad and I talk about all the time. So many people are open up. Chad is great at bringing people into his facility and looking at all the things and just giving and giving and giving without expectation. Um, especially in a market like now when people need help, like ask for it. Aaron's on here to help. The purpose of this podcast is to give you this stuff every single week and their tools to help you grow. But sometimes you need a little bit more personal attention now. So, you know, I'm assuming Aaron's like, Hey, yeah, just text him as long as it's between 10 PM and 2 AM. That's when he likes his text messages. We'll share his cell phone number for that. But I commend you, you know, I commend you, man, for coming on and being vulnerable and sharing the story because that is the power of the story is it allows these listening right now who've been in this situation, maybe you're currently in this situation or have not been in that situation, but looking to scale and grow, you know, to 50 million and they're sitting at, you know, 15, 20, 25, whatever, no matter which way you look at it, there's an opportunity to connect with Aaron to, to grow and scale the business. So, man, I, I, uh, I appreciate you, you coming on and sharing that story. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. If, uh, if I can do it, anybody can do it. Uh, you just get punched in the face enough times to learn how to get back up. Uh, just keep getting back up, right? That's right, man. I love it. Chad, you got any uh, you got any closing thoughts for our friend here or for our listeners? Yeah, I do. I, I don't have any, uh, you know, a ton of thoughts. I mean, I think the story is it speaks for itself, right? And it's all about resilience um, and uh, you know keeping at it and learning from both the good and the bad um, and, and 
continuing to move forward. And I think that that's something, especially in today's world, that's something we all can learn from because there's, there's stuff that's not going in our favor. So how do we learn from that? And, and uh, as you said, many a times throughout the podcast, uh, continue to move forward. So I, I want to close this thing out by sharing the new name. Are you ready? Okay, great. Okay, so if you weren't, I was going to tell you anyway. So to our listeners who've waited patiently for me to make this announcement of Aaron's new nickname, I listened to the story. I wanted to try to find something that I felt like fit the mold, okay? Like not just one part of the story, but the entire story, right? Like who is Aaron Hagen? You like the setup so far? Come on. Okay. <laughs> so, yes, yes, you're the CEO of Mr. Sparky. But I think, I think you're the CEO of Mr. Gritty. <laughs> he <laughs> is Aaron, Mr. Gritty Hagen. What do you think? Hey, I own it. That's good. M-I-S-T-E-R Gritty. There Mr. you go. <laughs> Let's go. Like it or not, that's what I'm calling you from here on out. I'm Let's changing go. your name in my cell phone to Mr. Gritty. And then all you got to do for our listeners, especially our younger listeners, who don't listen to this, but they're probably your kids. I need you to shoot a video of you doing the gritty <laughs> so we can share it with our, younger. and don't worry, Chad's going to do it right along with you. He loves no. to dance and perform for people. Oh, yeah. <laughs> to get with my 11 year old and uh, figure that one out. <laughs> that will be fantastic. If you would do the gritty, uh, I think it would be enjoyable. We will share that. So, Hey man, again, I appreciate you sharing the story. You know, um, Chad's good to have you back on here, brother, man. I miss you. And, um, and, you know, like I said, you share a lot of things on here too. And, 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 you know, sometimes telling the story is what helps, you know, the person that's listening is just to be able to relate. Um, and I, and, you know, all jokes aside, I use gritty because gritty is another word for perseverance. And that's what you've done to build this story. And it's what you'll continue to have to do as you keep growing. It's not like you're going to run into another problem. It just might not be as significant. Right. And we all go through it. So, Appreciate you coming on here, sharing the story to all the franchisees listening. Please listen to Aaron. And for all the other listeners that aren't in franchisees, just still just trying to do your thing, man. Like, keep persevering. Keep being gritty. Keep doing your thing. Ask for the help. Let go of your pride. Do all the things you got to do. Try all the things you got to try to try and keep moving forward. You don't got to do everything, but you got to do something. No zero days.